everyone and welcome to the new season of the ELT CPD podcast. We've been on a short break but we've had lots of downloads of our previous episodes and lots of new subscribers. So if you are new to the show, welcome and thank you for joining. We're kicking off this new season with our first mini series on how to write. First up, we'll be chatting to Tyson Seaburn, who recently released a book through ELT Teacher to Writer called How to Write Inclusive Materials. Hi Tyson, how are you? Hi, I'm just fine. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and have a chat. I'm really happy to be invited. It's a, it's a delight to talk about uh, these things. Yeah, perfect. So um, let's get started by hearing a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do. Uh, okay, so I am a teacher. I mean, I've been a teacher since 1998 when I started in Seoul. And I think that kind of laid the foundation for a lot of the interests that I have and the experiences that I have going into some of the topics that we'll probably talk about. And so I did general English teaching in private language schools for quite a long time. Um, and then about 12 years ago, I moved into the university sector mm -hmm. and started with EAP. Um, and around that time, I also was creating materials for a wide course unit of teachers yeah. to use. And so that sort of started, I suppose, a more formal experience with materials writing, I guess, because I had to really figure out how to get other people to use my materials. Yeah. And then since then, basically, I have I've been doing some administration and directing of a program. I've been doing some teaching in the classroom and some teacher training for Oxford, TEFL, Barcelona. Perfect. So how um, did you first become an expert in inclusive materials and material writing? I think that's a really difficult question to answer actually and and i actually had a, a long conversation with several people about the word expert to be honest mm -hmm. because I, I don't know how much of an expert i really feel like i am i mean yes i wrote this book and it sounds very definitive mm -hmm. in its title but it's a fluid and it's a learning experience and i'm myself continuously learning so i don't think i have all the answers yeah but i think what's led me to this point is first of all i identify in the LGBTQ community myself. And that I think I ignored a lot from my identity for a long time in my younger years of teaching because I was, you know, told by society and employers, you know, not to be out um, because students might react or, or what have you. But what I've learned as I've gotten older is actually that just like we're a model for students with learning or language, we're a model for students with identity as well. Definitely. And the way in which teachers um, talk about themselves or bring in materials or don't bring in certain materials um, says a lot to the students themselves too. And so I felt a, a kind of obligation almost to figure out a better way to produce materials and create an inclusive environment or a belonging environment, I guess, would be another way to put it for my learners but also for other teachers like myself definitely yeah um so as we're talking about inclusivity and belonging can you define what is meant by that term what is an inclusive material so i think the the main thing is that everybody feels as though the material represents them in some way shape or form mm -hmm. and so they can see themselves through the narratives that are being portrayed in the materials yeah. and as a result they can have meaningful interactions through language about you know different topics that are in their own lives and, and meaningful to them and when they don't see that in the materials which is fairly typical it may seem to a lot of people like it's not that important but coming from someone who is gay <laughs> I can say that when you don't see yourself portrayed or you only see yourself um, or people like you portrayed in one particular way, yeah. then you realize that that's what society thinks of you or that's what society values. And um, it can change the way you feel about yourself, um, not to mention disconnect you from the materials or wanting to talk and, and so on. And so inclusive materials is just sort of one branch of an inclusive practices experience but it is having materials that include a wide range of different groups of people and different types of people represented individually um, in a way that the learners themselves who identify in that way um, can see themselves represented and see 
um, ways in which they can talk and use language, but even those that don't can have their awareness raised that there's a variety of different people out there. Definitely. And sometimes there are things about society that are not perfect and we can try to change them. Are so there any good a long-winded answer. No, no, it's excellent. Are there any good <laughs> examples that you can think of at the moment that exist in the course materials, perhaps websites or any course books or anything like that? There's surprisingly little, to be honest. Um, I mean, I have been talking about this solidly for about four years. And mm -hmm. during that time, it's been more of an effort to get people to believe that there's a problem or see that there's a problem before they can actually start changing things and, and doing things like that. Having said that, there's little tangents here and there that are actually starting to work out. And mm -hmm. so um, Raise Up is a good example. Mm -hmm. It's a independent course book by um, James Taylor and Eli Combra. Mm -hmm. It's not one course book, actually. They have a, a variety of levels now. But initially, um, they started out with one where they invited different authors to try to create different lessons based on a certain number of principles that are, are remarkably similar to the ones that I'm ta talking about as well. Great. So I would say that's definitely one. Mm -hmm. um, then there are just random examples that I found around the internet, which I can't sort of list off the top of my head necessarily, but um, the only one that comes to mind, because I've included it in my own talks initially, was Catherine Billsborough did a My Family Unit for the British Council Teaching English site. Yeah a couple of years ago or several years ago now. And it was a nice introduction, but it was just a one-off lesson. It was very short. And I think those types of grassroots lessons or materials are what's being emerging over the last couple of years and to varying degrees of inclusivity, I guess, because yeah. everyone's sort of experimenting and, and trying to figure out what it means. Definitely. So is it mainly uh, sort of teacher made materials that you're coming across at the moment, would you say online? Yeah, I would say so. And, you know, again, not that many, like most people are still interested to learn how to do it, or they're a little scared to yeah, do it necessarily. Or, you know, they're doing it in little bits in their own local context, but they're not sort of reporting that for everybody else to, to take a look at. But there have been, you know, little inroads from major publishers, you know, I can see that they're paying attention to the conversation that's happening. And I don't know necessarily what the fruits of that will be, mm -hmm. but they're aware, definitely. And um, that comes out in Facebook groups that I'm in, for example, um, which is meant for freelance writers or people who are involved in publishing and they sort of talk about these types of issues. So I know it's happening and yeah. I just don't know exactly when something will be produced on a mass level. I guess with ELT it's quite hard, isn't it? Because there's so many different markets and there's so many restrictions within each individual geography sometimes as well. Um, let's mm -hmm. specifically think about Saudi Arabia. There might be different things there that other markets don't have, for example, other restrictions. So what are the limitations there in that respect? There's lots of them, really. And, um, you know, when I set out to talk about how to write inclusive materials, I always put the caveat right at the beginning that you know your local context better than I know my, yeah. uh, your context. And so, you you know, if you're going to fear your safety or, you know, or even less so your employment as mm. a result of doing this, then you need to put some thought really into what that means for you. Yeah. Um, so what I'm describing is sort of the... I, 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 I don't want to say ideal, the, the realistic version in a lot of places um, yeah. that can be done. And you need to sort of figure out whether that works in your context and what things you can actually do and can't do. So one um, kind of example of that was I, I did some work earlier this year for a, a major organization who normally I think is inclusive, but they were doing it for a particular market, mm -hmm. these materials for a particular market. And that market had anti, I, I don't think quite as extreme as some, but certainly not welcoming to uh, LGBTQ marriage and adoption and kids yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when I tried to make a lesson around or materials that involved very directly saying what I think, mm -hmm. um, I, I got pushback and I was told, 
okay, we feel this way, but this market and these materials are going to be used in places that don't feel this way. Can we figure out another way to include your ideas without sort of directly doing so? And so in that way, I had a little bit of experience with this kind of, okay, well, I'm going to try to do it myself, but I'm going to try to do it in a sort of back end way. Yeah. And I think some people have to work that out for themselves. Like how can they actually include, um, the principles more or less of inclusivity without specifically drawing attention to any one particular particular group. Definitely. I think that's mm. one of the, the things that materials writers think about as well. Perhaps if they consider themselves, okay, I want to include this certain aspect in my materials. I think maybe they would hope not to get pushed back, but maybe they would get pushed back from a publisher. So maybe that sort of um, stops the writer themselves including that in their materials so what would you say to a materials writer who's trying to do that but is worried about the pushback well i would first of all say just go for it initially mm. <laughs> and try to do what you want to do um, yeah. and include the the narratives that you want to include and see what happens because you you never really know yeah the second thing is try to work with the publisher or the anyway the people that you're talking to the target audience to see how you can actually do these principles in a way that's going to work for both of you. Yeah. Um, I think ultimately you want to, if, if there's a baby step, try to make sure that it avoids othering different individuals or avoids stereotyping or avoids, you know, a lot of the pitfalls that kind of have happened and, and led to me actually talking about this stuff now. So, I mean, it's a really complex question. I mean, ultimately, I would say refuse the work, like yeah. don't do it. You know, that would be what I would love to say. And I have said, actually, um, because, you know, when we ultimately agree with a compromise, then we're saying that compromise is what's OK. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to compromise to do these things. And so where is that line where compromise is no longer OK? So, I mean, if you have the luxury of you know, making that kind of decision, then I would fully support you refusing the work. Yeah. Um, but that's difficult to enforce, obviously. And I can't say bad things about someone who's accepting work when they have to feed their family. And, you know? Yeah, true, true. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in your uh, recently released ELT teacher to write a book, um, How to Write Inclusive Materials, I have just ordered myself a copy, so I'm looking forward to reading oh, it. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so it mentions, um, I've noticed uh, just looking at it online, that it mentions two different approaches to writing inclusive materials. So usualization mm -hmm. and disruption. So what do you mean mm -hmm. by these two terms? And could you give some examples? Yeah, so usualization, I, I, I kind of, to start, I guess, I kind of would like to say that they're complementary. They're not really meant to be disassociated from each other. Yeah. Um, but I will say that usualization is probably the starting point and the easier to begin with. Okay. And it's a term that was coined by Professor Sue Sanders. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just adopted it. But it, it pretty much means to increase the frequency by which underrepresented groups and individuals are included alongside the same narratives that are already there. Okay. So that um, you have more opportunity to see these groups in a variety of real, realistic situations. Mm -hmm. And they're represented as individuals because you don't only have just one opportunity, you have many opportunities mm -hmm. to include a variety of different narratives. So the word usual is there for a reason, because it's to suggest that um, we are all seen in a more usual situation, right? Mm -hmm. More frequently um, than before. And there was another term called normalization, which maybe some people have used, um, and I myself have. And the, the sort of criticism with that term, although they basically are approaching the same thing in the same way mm -hmm. is just that it sets up somebody to be normal and somebody to be abnormal. Yeah. And we don't necessarily want to create that dichotomy. Mm -hmm. So whether or not you agree with that or it's necessary or not, the, the term that I've chosen to adopt is usualization for, for that reason. Practical ways you do that is by looking at the, the narratives and by narratives, I mean the, 
images, the videos, the audio, the text, uh, all those things combined are sort of create narrative that you would include in your materials. And mm -hmm. of course, you would prefer them to be authentic and come from you know, real places. But um, examine what materials you're using in those aspects and look to see what type of people are actually represented and what is being said about their story and about who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think what most people will find is that there's a number of groups that are underrepresented or completely invisible um, from the materials that exist. And so you want to take a look at all of those different aspects of narrative and bring in a variety so that there is, you know, a gay man, for example, in one part, um, and he has his own character. He's not representing all gay men out there. It's just, just him. Yeah. Um, and then there are other LGBTQ characters throughout as well. Um, so it's not just one, you know, gay character, one unit mm -hmm. on gay people, for example. It's spread throughout, just like everybody else is. Yeah. So I think that's sort of the gist of a usualization approach. And then a disruptive approach is just called that for a lack of a better term, quite frankly, um, because the point of disruptive approach is to really disrupt the sort of status quo mm -hmm. of the way things already are. And when you do that, um, you interrupt the, that sort of flow, if you're sort of thinking of it like that, so that something people notice and people have to change and people have to think and talk about these things. Mm -hmm. So whereas a usualization approach is really increasing the frequency by which you see these narratives, and not really focusing on the characteristics per se yeah. um, of those of those people. A disruptive approach aims then to find um, a situation that's happening in society mm -hmm. that is unfair or unequitable to a certain group of people, okay. um, and then bring in narratives um, those people, but also other people to try to make connections between the two groups to show how this status quo is unfair to um, more than just that one group, but you're including that group's experiences as a sort of springboard, I suppose, to talking about how to make change um, for better for, for everyone. And so that sounds really abstract when I talk about it like this, but um, a, a sort of concrete example you might think of is like, think of, wheelchair access, mm -hmm. for example, we'll just take that group, uh, the disabled group as a as an example this time, wheelchair access to buildings or classrooms, even is uh, an example of a status quo situation that is not fair to a certain group of people. So yeah. let's start there. And then um, we would then bring in say an image of a classroom or a school with stairs leading up to it, and there's no ramps or you, you take a look at your own classroom and talk about or think about wheelchair accessibility as an issue within your own classroom and ask learners to sort of talk about that situation. Who is this space unfair to? Mm -hmm. And get them to sort of bring, bring their own experiences and their own ideas to it. Okay. This sort of builds a kind of um, diagnostic sort of because you can find yeah. out whether or not your learners actually think there's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also you can try to see if the learners themselves feel that there's a problem in this space that maybe isn't the one related to wheelchairs that you think you were going to just start things out with. Mm -hmm. Then you can have the, the learners then discuss how the stairs or the classroom cause problems for different groups of people, for the students or for themselves or for other types of people. That can try to sort of build a connection between learners who are in a wheelchair or learners who are not in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, so get them all in sort of invested into this situation. And then finally try to create or give the learners space to actually solve that problem or create solutions to that problem. So then I would task the learners with, you know, reconfiguring the classroom space mm -hmm. for this group of people mm -hmm. that normally doesn't have access. And so this is what I mean by disruptive is that I'm actually not just including someone in a wheelchair yeah. in a narrative alongside everybody else, but we're actually using the characteristics and the experiences of that underrepresented group as a springboard to talk about how society is treating any group unfairly and how can we change those things. So that's sort of a non-LGBTQ example, but it 
I like to use it because um, when we talk about inclusivity, quite often people default to queer, uh, the queer community. Mm -hmm. And it's not simply that. It's, it's a large number of us that um, are, are underrepresented in various ways. And, and so those two approaches in a nutshell is kind of a yeah. difference between them. But I think they do complement each other. They're not choose one or the other. Yeah. You do usualization throughout your materials and you do disruption here and there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, they work really well together in that in that way. Definitely. I really wish that I was back in the classroom myself so that I could actually try and use these things that you're suggesting in, in the classroom as well. Because not only are you practicing language, but you're also sort of challenging mindsets essentially of students as well, you know, and opening their minds to, to different situations perhaps that they hadn't thought about as well. Totally. And, you know, you bring up a good point that um, I try to help other educators really realize about themselves is that we're not simply language technicians, mm -hmm. you know, and if and if we see ourselves only as language technicians, then I think we're doing a disservice to our ability in the classroom or, the you know, the dynamic that we even have in the classroom just by default, yeah. but to our students as well, you know, we're not you know, Google necessarily, or just Google Translate, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are educators. And I think as educators, no matter which context you're educating in, or which type of group, um, type of person you're educating, the goal of education is to make people's lives better. Mm -hmm. And so one of those um, ways you can make people's lives better is to include topics and people and narratives that are meaningful to the group of people that you're looking at and, and discussing with and give them the opportunity to make their lives better and your life better and, and see where there are problems and how they can fix them. I mean, I want to empower the, the learners to feel as though they can change things and not just, you know, play the game or accept the way things are. Definitely. Absolutely. Um, so thinking about the two approaches that you just said, if you were sort of giving some advice to a materials writer, we sort of touched on this a bit earlier. Would you say that following one of these approaches in materials is a, is a good avenue to take? Or would you say that, like, what advice would you give to a materials writer who's looking to change and sort of include things in their materials that perhaps they hadn't considered before? Well, I 100% I think that materials writers should include these approaches, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, you know, materials writers are kind of a smaller group of people then this addresses like teachers themselves yeah. actually create the majority of materials, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I think my advice to all people basically would be you, you can't really just start adding inclusive principles um, and then be done with it and think you, Oh, you know, I've ticked this box and it's done. Like you really do have to put in the work to be able to recognize that there's an issue in the materials to begin with mm -hmm. and then be able to identify why there's an issue in those materials, what the issue is. Um, and then um, you have to do the work to learn about how to actually include these different people that you don't belong with. You know, like if, if you yourself are not a, you know, a 40 year old gay man, mm -hmm. you may not have experience like that yeah, person. Definitely. So you, it's going to be problematic for you to just kind of make it up. Mm -hmm. And so, um, whereas I, you know, I've lived in a straight world my whole life. I have a pretty good sense of what it means to, to, to be straight, mm -hmm. but you or anybody would need to like do a, a bunch of readings, um, yeah. find a lot of experiences on YouTube, for example, mm -hmm. you know, gather a library of, background knowledge that you can get just like you would if you were writing a unit on vegetarianism or, or something yeah. like that, mm -hmm. you know, and then once you have a remarkable, you know, sort of plethora of experiences from different groups of people that you can draw from, then you can include those things more, more naturally in your materials. I mean, if you look at my bookmarks in, in my Google Chrome, I have folders on folders on folders of, you know, newspaper articles, YouTube clips, all these, um, you know, blog posts, all sorts of things that are from the perspective of a wide variety of mm -hmm. people. Definitely. And so, you know, it's not like just once and done, you have to do it for a long period of time. So. 
Yeah, I was also going to say. That's my advice. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I was also going to say it's like 100% worth looking outside the ELT sphere as well because it's not oh, just limited, totally. yeah, like you just said. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and in fact, I would say 99% of what you look at is outside ELT, at least at the moment. You know, there isn't much in ELT to really look at. There's, a, you know, a lot of sort of academic work that's happening, um, mm. which is really interesting to look at. And, and obviously, you know, if you look at some uh, someone like Ashley Moore or um, JPV Gerald or VJ Ramjatan, you know, there's a, a variety of people that are doing good work. Mm. Um, however, and, and I mean in ELT, but um, most of the experiences that people have from underrepresented groups, they themselves are not in ELT. So, yeah. you know, you're going to find, you know, books all over the place in chapters or indigo or whatever bookstore it is that you shop at absolutely youtube has tons and tons and tons mm -hmm. of videos from a wide variety of perspectives so that's an excellent resource i mean it's you just kind of have to open your eyes and and look around definitely and um, we have a question from a listener kind of related to what we're just talking about actually um, it was, I sometimes find it difficult to know the right word to use when I'm referring to marginalized groups. What can I do to improve this and how do I know which is the correct word to use? So I guess an example would be reading, as you said. Um, but yeah, what would your advice be? Well, I guess it depends on the term. I mean, I think the, the term to, the, the first thing I would suggest is like go to the source. Mm -hmm. So look within the community that you're talking about to see how they talk about themselves. Yeah. It doesn't always work out. I mean, you have to be a little cautious, but um, that is a good place to start because mm -hmm. then you can see what words are used um, in a way that aren't stereotypical or aren't demeaning or, or what have you. So like if you're looking at the queer community, you know, you want to Google a site that has a list of vocabulary mm -hmm. that's written by the queer community mm -hmm. um, because that will give you the right terminology to use in that situation. Yeah. I mean, there's asterisks to this because, of course, you know, you wouldn't go to a, you know, a, a pop or a hip hop video to necessarily find which words you're going to be using to refer to black people, you yeah. know, but you, you, you have to look at you know, a different type of source that mm -hmm. still comes from that community. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely. And so I don't know if there's specific words like marginalized that this listener is wondering about, mm -hmm. but that is my general advice is that go to the source and, and talk to a, a variety of different people from within that community and see what they think. Yeah. And that can help define those things. Although throughout my book, um, if I can plug it slightly, I have and define terms all the way through the book. Right. Uh, so if I use one, there is a, you know, a section where it defines what those terms are and gives a reference in some cases as to where I found that from. So, you know, use examples. Excellent. Well. And buy your teacher to write a book as well. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that would be great. <laughs> Um, speaking of other resources, because obviously we've got your ELT teacher to write a book, um, are you giving any sort of upcoming webinars, sessions, conference talks, or anything like that that people can tune into to, to find out more? I do speak fairly frequently at conferences, actually, um, mm -hmm. especially about this topic lately. It's, uh, it's afforded me a lot of um, interest. Uh, yeah. So I will be talking locally unfortunately, so it's not um, broadcast um, to a, a school board, which has been very nice to be invited by a school board, like a public school board yeah. to talk about these, a Catholic public school board, wow. I might add. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's pretty cool. But mm -hmm. otherwise, I, I don't have any engagements at the moment that are lined up for 2022 that um, I can specifically talk about. Mm -hmm. But if you honestly go to YouTube or Google me, there is a, a large variety of recordings out there that uh, is pretty easy to find, I would imagine. Perfect. But yeah, just keep your ear to the ground. I'll, I'll be somewhere. Um, we do have a couple more questions. So one is from another listener, which we received um, today. So the question is, how can I avoid tokenism in my materials? That's a great question. And I do talk about that in the book, too, and, and define what tokenism is mm -hmm. um, as well. So to start with that, you know, it's 
it's kind of checking a box rather than having a meaningful um, inclusion. So I guess that would be a simple way to define tokenism. Um, you, you can always think of like a school that is entirely made up of white teachers. Yeah. And then they think, oh, this doesn't look good. We better hire a black teacher. And so they do, mm -hmm. but they don't actually involve that black teacher's um, expertise or experience in any way that is meaningful to to change the school policies or what have you. Yeah. It's just for face value. That would be tokenism or a great example. So to avoid tokenism, I think that the simplest way to avoid it is when we do usualization, we're not including one person or one narrative yeah. because um, that, even if it is well-intentioned, it increases the likelihood of making a reductive version of that person yeah. in those materials. And then that person becomes the sole representative mm -hmm. of that group of people. Yeah. And optically, it looks like you're just throwing them in for, for diversity. Absolutely. So a usualization approach requires more inclusion and more frequent inclusion. So there would be, um, you know, more than one person in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. more than one type of neurodivergent um, uh, story, mm -hmm. more than one type of queer person. Mm -hmm. And not only, you know, the best, most polished version of all of those people either, because, yeah. you know, we're just human. So mm -hmm. we are good and not so good sometimes and have, you know, the same types of problems in some cases, other people. And so it's really not reducing uh, an entire group of people down to one thing just for the sake of diversity. Mm -hmm. You um, mentioned their pictures and, and specifically um, if we're thinking about artwork briefs and things like that, or even teachers including images in their own materials, do you have any mm. recommendations for photo sourcing websites that are more inclusive? Because typical ones such as Shutterstock, Pixabay, they're not particularly diverse when you type in sort of um, woman studying it comes up a young attractive skinny white woman studying you know so have you got any <laughs> recommendations for for better photo sourcing resources yeah there's i mean there's a a number of free ones that are you know sometimes you know hit or miss and then there's also the paid ones so i mean i i kind of give a list of some of those in the book as well yeah um but off the top of my head um I would say there's a a site called Body Liberation. Okay. I think with Lindley Ashleen, I think is her name. Mm -hmm. Who is there? Anyway, it's um it includes pictures um, and images from a wide variety of body types, so it isn't focusing just on one, you know, that you would typically see in a course book. Mm -hmm. There's also um, women in color in tech. Um, they have a database of uh, a wide variety of, of women in color who, who do technology jobs because that is something that you don't see very well represented in, in most places. True, yeah. There are, I think it's called Broadly, um, but it, it involves um, a, a variety of queer situations. Mm -hmm. So there are trans people, there are non-binary people, um, as well as you know, the typical ones you find in most stock image sites these days, if yeah. you type in queer, there's like two handsome guys kissing, for example, or holding hands, you know, so I mean, that's there maybe too, but there's a variety of different ones that you can find. The gender spectrum collection is mm -hmm. another one. Um, that's really good. So I mean, th there are some out there. Mm -hmm. But even in the stock image sites, um, the regular ones that we might use, it takes a certain amount of um, experimentation through your search terms to try to find what you want, but you can often find it. And, but it does take you down quite a rabbit hole, actually, to, to yeah. find different images that you're looking for. And you'll find that some of the search terms you're using are just are not effective. And maybe the, the pictures you want don't exist. Um, yeah. But I, I do think you want to think of what you want in your in your head first. This is one approach I take usually. And then try all sorts of search terms that I can get um, to to come up with that. That's one way I go go with it. And that takes a while. It's not a, a small endeavor. Yeah. The other way 
you go with these types of image sites is you start with the kind of activity or, you know, what language would be used in an activity that um, you want to use in your lesson. So mm -hmm. like if you wanted to use present tense verbs, for example, then you would look for, you know, a park, mm -hmm. for example, park scene and, and sort of see, it, can you get up any images of parks where there's lots of people doing things and then you can pull language from there. And so, you know, that's another way to go about it when you're trying to look for pictures. So, I mean, ultimately, I use Adobe stock photos, which I pay for. Okay. That, to me, is one of the better sites. And I think, you know, there's a certain get what you pay for maxim that does tend to work out. Yeah. But, you know, there are other places, like I've mentioned um, earlier, that are putting together databases of other materials but you know the quality of those ones can be hit or miss as well so definitely you know it's it's just a trial and error period at this point yeah. absolutely yeah 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 i mean i mean there's one more thing i'll talk about images just to bring it up because digital materials are a thing yeah uh i think it's always important that we get in the practice of writing alt text mm -hmm. for our images and our videos for for people who cannot or for her use screen readers for example because you can't um you know instagram is lovely but you, you know if you just post photos there's a lot of people who actually can't see the photos yeah. or when you do that on twitter for example you know um you post an image of of promoting something mm -hmm. for example but if it's an image a screen reader can't see it and mm -hmm. so i've really had to make a concerted effort myself to actually go okay how am I going to describe this photo yeah. in a way that is going to generate a picture for someone who needs that type of generated picture from words? Yeah. And in doing that alt text, you actually start to get a little bit better at creating search terms because you realize, how am I going to describe this image yeah. accurately yeah, so that true. it actually portrays what's in that image really well? So it's a good exercise to try. Um, so if yeah. anyone wants to get a um, copy of your book, where can they find it? So it's published by ELT Teacher to Writer. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, there's always long URLs, you know. So the easiest one to, to do is to go to bit.ly mm -hmm. slash how to inclusive. Okay, perfect. And that takes you directly to the space where you can buy the book. Mm -hmm. And then throughout social media, I use the hashtag how to inclusive okay. on all posts that are related to the book or related to inclusion diversity and representation and belonging. So yeah. if you look for that hashtag on any of the socials, basically you'll find somewhere a link to the book, okay. um, hopefully. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on and for having a chat. Um, we'll include links to your book and um, some of the people you mentioned and some of the sites you mentioned as well. Um, and of course, I will include alt text with the promotion of this episode now. I understand what it's for. Awesome. Um, well, good. I've done my job. Definitely. <laughs> thank you so much. And um, hopefully we speak again soon. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Have a great day. So thanks so much for listening to the show today. We know we definitely got a lot of takeaways, so we hope you did too. In our next episode, we'll be talking about how to write primary materials. Do give us a like, follow and subscribe to us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube to hear when the next episode goes live. Once again, thanks for listening and bye for now.